Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted Double Digits number 10. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. We've had a busy week, haven't we? Mark, you and I were at the launch of Simon Caldwell's new novel, The Beast of Bethulia Park, which is brilliant. Recommend anyone to go and get that as a Christmas present for their loved ones this year. It was really lovely, wasn't it? We had a great night, didn't we? And uh, loads of brilliant friends there and uh, lots of good chat. Yeah. yeah Gavin, Unfortunately, Gavin couldn't, couldn't make it. Yeah, sadly. You're now in France, aren't you, Gavin? No, sadly not. Sadly not. I am. I'm, 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 I'm now in France, but I missed all those mutual good friends and was glad you had a lovely time and lived vicariously off your photographs. There we go. We've got, a, well, there's always a lot to talk about. Um, what's come up this week is really a story of calling out. Um, we've had, first of all, Rome calling out Beijing for violating the terms of their accord. Um, and we've also had Cardinals Muller, Ladaria and Ule calling out the Germans for their synodal way. Um, and I suppose Matthew 6.24 comes to mind. In both stories, we have uh, you can't serve two masters. So, oh, and also you two had a conversation, which is well worth listening to. Please, anyone who hasn't heard it, go to the Merely Catholic podcast where you've discussed uh, Vatican II, the spirit of Vatican II. It's absolutely brilliant. It's a must listen. Um, but I'll come to you first, Mark, about um, the China deal, which uh, who knew seems to be blowing up. <laughs> yeah, we've got no idea really what's going on um, with China, have we? Because the, the, the Vatican have been so quiet and they haven't spoken. And it's been a moratorium on speaking out about the Uyghurs and the, the abuse, about uh, civil rights issues. They just seem to have been quiet on everything. And Cardinal Zen has been calling, you know, been sort of speaking out about this um, agreement that they've signed, a two-year agreement they've just renewed for a further two years. And they've they've not spoken about Cardinal Zen's been on trial in Hong Kong. He was sentenced on Friday. But it's been just uh, thing after thing. Um, and then the Pope made some really strange comments on the plane home from Kazakhstan about China, where he said, you know, oh, I wouldn't, call, wouldn't say it's non-democracy and... Like just really uh, peculiar sort of things to say. Lord Patton, um, the last British governor of Hong Kong, has absolutely slammed the Vatican um, over the over the agreement. And then, so it's been anyway. The, so the Vatican basically has been carrying on, and they've been, I think, they've cloaked the whole thing in pragmatism. They've been saying their their way of justifying it is to say that this is pragmatic. They're being pragmatic. So they've got to be, in order to help Chinese Catholics, um, they've got to be quiet and they've not got, you know, they've got to be careful about what they say, um, which is a form of moral relativism. I don't think that that works. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, on Saturday, we had this bulletino on the Vatican website, um, basically the Vatican calling out um, the Chinese Communist Party, was saying that they'd not been, um, they'd not basically stuck to the terms of the agreement um, they had appointed a bishop to a, a diet. That's quite interesting because a lot of people were shouting about it, saying, oh, this is the collapse of the, the Chinese deal. I'm not quite sure that it is because this is a guy who was um, ordained uh, in the underground in 2014 yeah. with Pope Francis' agreement, um, but he's been appointed to a diocese which the Vatican doesn't recognise. And that seems to be what the Vatican's problem with it is. They've, the Chinese Communist Party have appointed uh, bishops without the Vatican's approval before, and basically the Vatican just retrospectively approves them, mm. which is another problematic thing about the agreement. Um, but why all of a sudden mm. the Vatican have taken to um, speaking out about this particular instance is really, really interesting. Mm. It's Bishop John Peng, isn't it? Who was yeah, appointed Bishop by... Peng. Yeah. Uh, the key thing is that he's been incarcerated by yeah. the authorities and obviously put under some pressure, uh, which makes it look like, I mean, what are they talking about? Pressure? Yeah. Was he tortured? God love him. You know, it's like you don't, you just don't know. But he was made to um, swear this oath of allegiance to the Chinese Communist Party, which obviously, as one of the underground bishops, was something he was fighting against before. Mm. Um you know, is it just a puppet thing? Is it, there could be some real horrible manipulation going on where they've taken one of the bishops that were actually on side with, with the church 
and they're trying to turn him to be on side with the Communist Party. So it's a, there's a real mind thing going on there, Gavin, isn't there? Like a real uh, mind police thing. Can you police what someone thinks and believes in their heart? You know, can you? I think the difficulty this poses for us is that without knowing what's going on, without being told and nobody is, it's very hard to make any kind of moral judgment. At, at one end of the possible interpretive scale is the the possibility that that the Pope is in the same position as, as the Pope was in the Second World War. Why didn't he speak out against Hitler? Because the first time he did, Hitler uh, decimated a, 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 a Yugoslav or Polish town, killing about 10,000 people and said, if you criticize me in public again, this will happen again. And so uh, from that moment onward, the Vatican's um, conflict with Hitler took place out of sight, underground, and entirely discreetly. And it's taken about 50 or 60 years to rehabilitate the Pope's reputation with the opening of the archives. So that ought to be a lesson to us all that without knowing, we should be careful to jump to judgment. On the other hand, some people are saying that that uh, too many Catholic priests have misbehaved on Grinder, and the Chinese government has all the details and uh, and is prepared to leak them. If So whatever form of pressure it is, there's some form of pressure going on. But it's extremely difficult for ordinary Catholics not to be profoundly demoralized at the treatment of Cardinal Zen and the pressure put on otherwise faithful Catholics. It's, I mean, this is one of the things that Damien Thompson, I think, is very good at um, uh, in, in his repertoire. And that is he simply won't let the betrayal by the Vatican of the Chinese Catholics go, and nor should he. I think we have to go on saying that until we're given the facts, this is outrageous and quite and very bad indeed. Mm, and continue to pray for Cardinal Zen and all those who are who are oppressed in this way. Um, we move from there to the German synodal way, where, as I said, Cardinals Ule, Ladaria and Muller have have been critical. I know you've written about this, both of you have in the Catholic Herald um, this week. And Mark, one of the things you were saying in the, on the podcast with Gavin was that they see acceptance as more important than faithfulness. And I think this is a story um, that just runs through everything, which is there's this battle between just being faithful to Christ and his church and um, then uh, trying to be accepting or, or to make the church more acceptable, which is not what we're called to do. Uh, Mark, do you want to tell us a bit about uh, what you've written and what you know about this? So I, I downloaded the documents. They were released. It's a really unusual thing for the Vatican to actually release these documents. So it was um, a report given by uh, the head of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, which used to be the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, um, Bishop Luis uh, Ladario, and uh, Cardinal Ule, who's the prefect for bishops. And they both did reports. So it's very clear, I think, when you read what they've said, that they've... They're coming at it from those two perspectives, one from the, the clarity of doctrine and one is coming out from the, um, the fraternity of bishops. Um, and certainly Ule's um, report is very uh, gracious in, the, in its opening and, and speaks very warmly of the fraternity that all the, the episcopacy share. So um, you can see that he's trying to, that both of them are trying to sort of work towards unity in that respect. But this is really good news, I think, for everyone who's worried about the, about the way things are going at the moment, because both of the cardinals speak with absolute clarity. I was yeah. so overjoyed to hear it. And really, I was uh, in my mind, I was juxtaposing it with our, the Catholic Bishops of England and Wales plenary meeting where they put a podcast out and it was absolutely dire, you know, what they were saying with no joy whatsoever. And these guys, you know, both the cardinals, they're speaking about the magisterium, the gospel, doctrine. They're, you know, it's it's like the old, it's like the old days. It's like, um, you know, proper Catholic teaching. Uh, and I, it just made me really, really happy to read it. Um, and so I put, I, I wrote a report for the Herald, and it's it's I've tried to sort of pricey what they said there, but basically. I was unaware how, I mean, I knew the synodal way had some crazy ideas, mm. but it's not until you read this report, these reports that you really get an idea of just how batty they are. Mm. And what's really concerning is how has it got to the point where these German bishops who are, they've got the cure of souls, you know, 
how on earth have we got to a position where they are so at odds with with doctrine and the cardinals point that out they say you know your position on sexuality is basically that we should throw everything that, that the church has ever taught in the bin and come up with a completely new idea about it and the same on i mean i thought the the way they theme they dealt with female ordination was absolutely brilliant as well and they keep referring to the magisterium and i think that could run through our conversation this week because do you remember was it in the last episode Gavin I was saying about that there see you know the Pope seems to have this um sway of doing things where he starts this really messy conversation and but he in, in ultimately he wants he wants those discussions to be out in the open and then for the magisterium to pronounce on it and that re you really see that coming across in the report of these two cardinals see they're both referring to the fact that there is a limit to discussions um and you know brilliantly they also say that, that it's about the faithful mm -hmm. and how would the you know how, why it's it really gives them a telling off the germans basically you know it really does and thank god for it but it, it does lead me to concern that these are the men who are in charge of the the poor catholics and i know some really great faithful catholics in germany i mean God love them. How are they coping with this lot of absolute heretics? I've absolutely mm. no idea. Well, Pope, Pope Francis himself said, didn't he, about uh, the difference between catechism and, and catechists and theologians uh, mm. this week. And he was saying that it's absolutely proper that catechists teach uh, faithful to the church, the magisterium, to the teaching, to tradition, to scripture, but that, that it is the place for theologians to throw up and discuss these things but my concern when we spoke about it was that that may have been less problematic in an age when we didn't hear everything but now we're in an age of social media and everything is reported what you have is you have catechists trying to teach the church and be faithful uh, but then they hear these discussions that theologians are having maybe as you say just to throw it around and uh, uh, but but for it not to to land and change anything but they but it's coming to the ears of the faithful and so there, there it's creating this ambiguity, which is really problematic, problem for, for catechists. Uh, Gavin? Well, I'm at a loss again. I mean, I, I, I love what Marcus said, and I love that's his take on it. Um, and, and there's always the possibility that the German bishops, the German church was set up as a kind of stalking horse, and the intention was always to pull them back in at some point. And in some sort of inept Hegelian way, uh, a synthesis I mean, a thesis and antithesis jostles together with some form of intended a uh, recognizable synthesis at the end of it and and you know again we won't know until we got to the end but i was i was directed to uh, an article in the european conservative this last week which was giving a review of Vaznevsky's two two volumes on the vatican i don't know if you you know about them mm. um well I'm so I'm going to read this. I'm not in, I'm not endorsing it. I'm just putting it out there. Uh, but uh, he was saying that the the the, the problem um, is the enduring problem for the church, as well as analysing the Pope's various bizarre synods, his tampering with the catechism, his mishandling of the scandals and the hierarchy, his positive distortion of doctrine, his introduction of Amerindian paganism to the Vatican. And we're left with a picture of a Pope who has helped to normalize homosexuality and divorce, encourage Eucharistic sacrilege, fermented an already emerging schism in the German church, instrumentalize the catechism to promote explicitly condemned opinions, sold out Chinese Catholics, ousting faithful bishops from their sees to replace them with communist agents, institutionalized ideological language, inserting LGBT into Vatican documents, undermined, undermined the highest calling of the church, namely that of consecrated contemplatives, introducing the worship of pagan facility gods, criticizing married couples open to life as people who breed like rabbits, inviting population control fanatics to be Vatican advisors, and covering up or gravely mishandled abuses by sexual predator clergy. Well, it's all true. And the difficulty is, is it, is it, is in, is it incompetence or is it by design? Um, and I don't know where to, to, to make the judgment there. I hope 
its incompetence and what Mark has described as being a very optimistic break put on by two cardinals is exactly what it seems. And that would be very good. So they just they just set up the Germans, pumped them up full of encouragement and lack of restraint, wound them up and let them go. And were a bit fr freaked out when they discovered they'd launched a full on Protestant uh, neo-reformation without any mechanism for holding them back. Maybe maybe that's the case. But the difficulty we face each time is that the whole point about being a Catholic is you know what the faith is, you know what the church stands for. The faith has evolved like a like a tree growing very slowly, nourished by the Holy Spirit, ring after slow ring after slow ring. And anything that, that, that undermines that is seriously problematic. And so this whole atmosphere of ambiguity is what I find most difficult. I don't want to attribute motives because how would I know? But but I think one of the things that we're, we want to, I want to do, maybe, and I think we want to do here, is to reach out to anxious Catholics to say that whatever happens in this decade of our lives, it cannot destroy the church. It cannot change the Catholic faith. Whatever, whatever the disturbance of the synodal path and the synodal way, uh, the ultimate, the, the you know, the emerge, what emerges will be Catholicism, uh, uh, even if it's messy and, and there needs to be a fight for it. And one of the reasons we're speaking out in this particular way is in order to strengthen those who are faithful. So I'm very, very pleased that, that this document in the name of the two cardinals appeared restraining the Catholics. I think we've got to wait and see what effect it has and whether or not, uh, you know, where the breaks, where the breaks lie if they're being imposed from the centre that is that is exactly the right thing that's exactly the point and what was interesting was at the beginning of the week you know the the meeting with the german bishops were at, it was at the end of their ad limina and it was there was supposed to be this stage meeting with the pope uh, and he didn't turn up yeah and at that point all the progressive sort of people on the on the internet were saying oh that's it it's an endorsement you know they were spinning it as an endorsement and then um, get, deal. <laughs> yeah and then you get the two mm cardinals so always with the pope there's i mean he still hasn't actually said anything himself and exactly as you say it, what he does with father james martin and all that you know it seems to be pushing it you know it seems to be encouraging these ideas and then he doesn't speak clearly on it and instead he gets two other guys to come in there and they do speak clearly on it and thank god that they do and I, so I would exactly, and, and at that point, then you had all those same people running around like the sky was falling in on the internet, you know, sort of saying, oh, what's going to happen with the synodal way now? And I think that's an important point because once you've got these two high ranking prefects saying these things, they can't then endorse the same ideas when they come through in the synod, in the synod of synodality. Mm -hmm. You know, these are all the things that Cardinal Grech has been sort of pushing as well. And you you can see why exactly as you say because it's what the pope seems to be all about but now you've got two prefects basically saying that they can't go down that route that that, that synodal doesn't go down that route and it doesn't break radically with the magisterium thanks be to god which is what we all know what we keep saying and you know so like where does he go it just always seems to be chaos you know do you remember when he said right at the beginning to the to the youth um go and make a mess oh has he made a mess hasn't he he's made, <laughs> you know he's really good at making a mess i'd say that much for him anyway so i don't know we'll like you say we'll have to wait and see i suppose won't we yeah and pray for him and and, and pray for the pope um pray for the pope with even more enthusiasm than we prayed for popes before um only only prayer will sort this out well, this is what I was saying to Mark before you arrived, Gavin. We we're waiting for you um, about uh, Peter Crave talks in his book about who our enemy is. You know, who, we're so busy fighting. We we thought for you know for years, is it the Protestants? Is it the Jews? Is it the heretics within the church? Is it the liberals? Is it the atheists? And of course, all of that's a distraction. That all of these are our patients. Um, they're they're victims of the enemy. Um, they're deceived. And so, wh where we see this failure to uh, be faithful to remain faithful to the church we we all we you know we can pray and say well that they're they're victim to the enemy who's looking to divide us and we see these apostasies that come out with with this not away and and the light is being shone now in that that darkness the, the these things these ideas about history judging revelation about freedom as autonomy um and they're in the light and so now they're in the light they are they're, they're, I think that's a good thing in a sense because now they're exposed and we can see that's the way it, the, the way they 
uh, are presenting and, and they can be challenged. So we just continue to pray, as you say. And and not take revenge or or not make ad hominem statements. We I think what you said is important because one of the things that it's difficult to do is to see beyond the person making the mess mm -hmm. to the instigation or the instigator of the mess in the first place. As St. Paul says, we're fighting an, an invisible enemy. We know what he looks like. We know what he smells like, what his fingerprints are. And it's quite important we don't attack uh, uh, we, we don't attack people, even though they offer themselves as, as instrumentally for the mess, because we know that, that they're being they're being used as agents of 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 difficulty. So it's a it's a difficult balance, but I think one that all critics of well, everyone who wants a ref the reforming of the church needs we all we all bear it in mind. And we can all be vulnerable to it. I think this is the thing is we no one can stand above and say, well, look at them. They're vulnerable to 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 the enemy. We all can be, which is why it's so important for us to stay rooted uh, and and keep going to the sacraments, um, going to confession, uh, praying, having this prayerful life that you've spoken about and how difficult it is. It's, it doesn't come easy, but it's a it's it's a constant. And, and we take our eye off Christ at our peril. So all of us have to have to be. It's not about us judging from a, from a distance and saying, "Look how they've got it all wrong," <laughs> but it's about us trying to keep rooted in Christ, isn't it? Yes. Good. <laughs> we've had a brilliant finish in our parish this week. We've had the the forty hours. I think I sent you a picture, guys. Yeah. And yeah. It, I mean, it just is such a beautiful way, you know, to sort of end the church's year and to. Mm enter into Advent and uh, I was fortunate enough to get to Mass yesterday and adoration where, where the church was all you know I think I'll put some pictures on my Twitter feed as well um, it's, it's, it's uh we're so lucky and that's what worries me really about um when you know when we talk about all these uh problems is that if we don't teach what the if we don't teach the beauty of the truth uh we'll end up losing all of this you know yeah. And that's what they're, you know, they're talking about people leaving the church. Uh, people are leaving the church because it hasn't got anything. It's, if it stops being relevant, if it stops having something to say to the culture, if it does, if it stops standing up for truth against all the relativism in society, then, you know, people will stop coming to church. So we've got to speak out uh, and be, you know, radical followers of Christ. Yeah, well, now is a good time to say, you know, it's the beginning of a liturgical year. It's a beautiful time any young people listening go go to your local church go to your parish church it's just beautiful and we do spend a long a lot of time because it's there are problems uh speaking about the problems and trying to trying to help clarify where there is ambiguity but at the end of the day let's try and get people into into the church get people before christ get people to the sacraments because he'll do the work and he'll find a way in if we only if we only open a little crack in the door and i think this 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 would be a beautiful time to begin at the beginning of a new year and as you say mark you posted some lovely pictures from your church so well i, 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 I was i was just going to say catherine at uh, when we were in the bar after the book launch we ended up in the bar, bar in the what was it the polish club and my yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, catherine was trying to convert the barman <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm, given, I given, given there's a danger of being critical i was going to try and offer catherine the opportunity to use some of the fruity phrases that she used in something she wrote this week she wrote about the ordination of, of women being a very bad bad idea again in in, in the herald beginning of a, a sparkling new career and what i liked about it was that the way in which um, articulating the faith of the church produced such a freeing affirming atmosphere i mean there was a lovely point where you talked about uh, a, a liberal man shutting you up because you weren't the kind of woman he thought you ought to be in the name of women's freedom what was the phrase you it was just very good and that, that, i thought the article was a very good example of of how, how liberating and wholesome the faith is when it's when it's expressed for what it is so one of the reasons for being critical of heterodoxy is because it, it takes the fun the joy the life the vivacity the authenticity out of life and and orthodox theology puts it right back in do you want to do you want to regale us with a couple of your phrases mrs bennett well yes i, I agree entirely i began by saying that um i've been put in my place a number of times by men standing up for women 
Uh, it's a little bit like what uh, Calvin Robinson experiences from those who are so desperately concerned with with uh, black people's rights that they shut him up for for saying that they disagree. It's the same kind of thing. It's when you're so gripped by the ideology that you don't see the person in front of you. Um, but I would, I would agree. Look, I, I'm a, a a Catholic woman and I love the faith. I love it's beautiful and I love the fact that it um, that it recognizes the dignity of me as woman. Um, and I don't need to be dignified by being given a role that is traditionally a male role. I don't understand it. I think it's an insult to women. Um, so I think this idea of not authorizing women to the priesthood is th the other thing is that the church doesn't have authority to do so. Um, another beautiful phrase from Peter Kreeft is uh, we, we are the we, we claim the least authority. Uh, we're not we're not we don't edit God's mail. We just deliver it intact. And so I think, yes, as you say, it's if part of the problem is just not 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 understanding. So you don't understand why something exists and you go about changing it anyway. It's like that idea of you find a, a, a fence in the field and you don't know why it's there. So you start smashing it down. Wouldn't it be worth find, finding out why it's there first? <laughs> so once you do um, and I don't feel at all disempowered or, or oppressed or silenced or rejected or shut up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm so pleased to, to be a member of a church that that recognizes um, that the beauty of womanhood and celebrates it. My goodness me, a church that has Mary, our lady, and holds her in the highest esteem. So beautiful, mother of the living. Wow, this is this beautiful stuff. Read Mulieris Dignitatum on the dignity of women. So much good stuff on the dignity of women in our church. It's just there. We just need to find it's, it and understand it. It's a, it sounds like the Polish barman didn't think you'd be badly disempowered. No. <laughs> you probably thought I had one too many drinks, though. <laughs> I, think, I think it's so brilliant. Like, and I always want... I think what you said in that article, you know, that needs to be heard time and time again. And it's that simple thing about you can, why, why is it, Gavin, that like so many people in the church seem to want to fight against, mm. uh, you know, what is the truth? Like, it, it's so obviously the truth when you heard it explained the way Catherine, Catherine explained it. And it's, and like you say, it's empowering, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. Mm. And yet it seems like so many of the hierarchy are determined to accommodate ideas that are antithetical to Catholic truth. And it's funny. I was reading... Yeah, I think you No, you... <laughs> I was only going to say, the, the, the narrative sort of feeds itself and it gets out and people uh, hook onto it. I said to someone the other day uh, who said to me, isn't it awful, woman was made from rib of Adam. And I said, yeah, what was Adam made from? Uh, yeah. Dust. <laughs> One of the things I was reading Jean René Girard again, uh, and with his emphasis on the mimetic, which means basically that we're really quite comfortable when we're imitating people and we want to belong to the group, we want to belong to society, and so we imitate people as we're feeling comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think that we mustn't underestimate the incredibly powerful secular atmosphere we live in. And people have been comfortable imitating egalitarianism. Uh, it takes quite a lot of courage to... Um, I remember John Stott wrote a wonderful book on the Sermon on the Mount called Counterculture. And I thought that was such a great title because uh, Christians are always called to be countercultural. And the grounds that the, the, the prevailing culture is, is, is going to be in the Johannine sense that of the world. So if we're going along with the culture that's around us, as we haven't been, we may have not been reading the Bible enough, but it really does take an immense amount of courage and reconfiguration. I, I think one of the things I felt most strongly as in my life as a Christian is this constant reconfiguration of my mind as well as my heart in terms of accepting Christian categories when the much more comfortable ones were the ones that my friends and colleagues and the media pushed around us. So I think it's about imitation and having the courage to imitate Jesus rather than imitate the people we live amongst in order to be accepted by them, consciously or subconsciously. It was interesting that pretty much that exact was what the cardinals did to the German bishops. They criticised the reductionist attitude, mm. the way mm. that they have reduced, you know, that they have not invested, that they've not uh, bothered to investigate or explain Catholic truth. I mean, how, that's quite a stark criticism mm. of the Germans mm. in other way, you know, to say, look, you don't actually understand the faith. This is bishops they're talking to, you know. So mm. exactly that thing that it's like, you know, if you reduce it all down to one idea, in the, in the German bishop's case, the idea that women can't be ordained and therefore the church is some way misogynistic you've completely failed to understand 
the beauty of, of Catholic truth. So like, that's a brilliant uh, segue there or a brilliant like way that we've connected those things. And like that, I think what you wrote about women fits in brilliantly with all of that as well, Catherine. So yeah, thank you. Think, no, well, thank you for, for saying so. Um, <laughs> but I think it's, it's now more than ever, it's needed. It, rather than run from the traditional teaching of the church and, and capitulate to these notions of sexism and uh, now is the time to say gosh look look at society look at the culture look at the mess we're in look at how we don't know what a woman is look at we don't know what a man is we don't know what men are called to be what women are called to be what masculinity means what femininity means we're in a total muddle my goodness we haven't made this clear and one way we can is to talk about the beauty of femininity and the church as the bride of christ and christ as and the masculinity of god and and jesus uh, and the, pr the priest in persona christi all of this could reveal so much about the complementarity of the sexes and instead we're say we're, we're talking about sexism it's so it's so empty and um shallow it offers nothing it's just it, so what it's like it's it's like this complete misunderstanding of freedom as just autonomy and not as uh, uh, as flourishing as as um you know authentic freedom which is liberating we should be talking about authentic freedom uh, and virtue and instead we're talking about doing what you want self-indulgence not being sexist it's just so empty i don't know what you can't hang anything on it you know well mark mark you had some second thoughts about our conversation so one of the things that happened in the week that just the highlight of my week was i phoned up mark and said are you up for doing this thing that I'd, I'd long wanted to do with him but the opportunity suddenly arose the opening so we discussed the difference between vatican ii and the spirit of vatican ii and, and um, the great thing about getting to know mark is that you only have to go for 10 or 15 minutes and he'll quote a Vatican II document at you, with, uh, <laughs> with a bit, which is very exciting if you like that kind of thing. And I really do. So, um, <laughs> But um, one of the things I'm having to do, I think a lot of I'm not alone in this, is to try and make a distinction between what the church is doing with in the wake of Vatican II and what the church fathers intended to do in Vatican II. And so Mark and I were batting this backwards and forwards during a a really informative podcast for, called Merely Catholic, the Catholic Herald uh, uh, pr promotes. And then um, the, the French have this lovely word, le mot d'escalier, the word you think of as you went downstairs, you, surely, you should have said it at the time. Mark, you had a few mots d'escalier you wanted to get back to. Uh, yeah, the, there was a couple of things. That I, I, when we were talking about um, traditionalists, uh, I kind of felt like I didn't really get across. Um, I used the example of my of my mum, who, uh, you know, really... Although she's gone along with the church quite happily, you know, like she's, uh, she, I don't think she'd go back now, um, if that makes any sense. But um, she really felt that there was a fracture, you know, when, because, and I wanted to make clear that that, that that was a terrible thing. I think that that imposition of the change of liturgy, like retrospectively looking back on it, I, I would find it very difficult to justify how they could have done that. I don't, I don't know that they'd even get away with it if they tried to do it today. But to literally stop overnight the way that um, that mass was celebrated and to replace it with something really quite radically different, you know, it must have been very jarring for the people. Even things like, uh, you know, Holy Communion, which is something that, you know, uh, uh, you could have a discussion about, like uh, um, the proper reception of Holy Communion. And they used to have monthly synodalities where you'd have men's synodality and women's synodality and you'd receive the Blessed Sacrament once a month. And obviously that there was, um, I can't remember what Pope it was now, but one of the Popes uh, wanted to encourage people to come and receive the Blessed Sacrament more often. And that's resulted in us now receiving Holy Communion at every Mass. And there are good things and bad things about it, I think, you know, and one of the things is the lack of reverence that, um, you know, ca like <laughs> Catholics who worry about such things, which I think we probably are, or who, you know, worry about our, our Lord or um, the way that, that that great gift is treated in the church. We mm -hmm. find it difficult to see um, it not being respected, paid the proper, you know, due respect. So that, that is a real problem. Um, whereas, like, the fact that people go to communion more often probably is a good thing, you know. So um, it's finding a balance always between those two things. But I do think that the when I go now after Samoran Pontificum, which you know, uh, broadened uh, the usage of the of the Usus Antiquia, the old, like the, uh, what we call the traditional Latin mass. 
um, that was the first time I experienced it. And um, I, I, you know, I have to say, I do love it. And I go once a month, we have it once a month in our parish. And, uh, and my, you know, my children would choose to go to it over, <laughs> you know, over the normal rite of the mass, which is really interesting. And as time has gone on, I really find that if you pray, you know, you're praying along with the mass and don't get me wrong. I, you know, I, I got to go to mass yesterday. It was beautiful in the, in the Novus Ordu and, and this morning, my parish, I'm so lucky in my parish, my parish priest is so faithful and, uh, you know, really carefully says the mass and it's beautiful. And, um, I, you know, I really do feel like it's a, a holy, um, celebration of the Eucharist. Um, but when you go to the old rite, there's so much more. There's so much more to the prayers, you know, in your... I've got to try and pick it up from there now, haven't I? Yeah, what was I saying? Sorry. And yeah, so, the old, so the old rite is uh, just... Well, I, there's a difference. And I don't know... I don't feel... I feel guilty even saying that, you know, because uh, for all the Catholics like me who go to the, the Novus Ordu, you know, you want to... I don't want to denigrate it in any way, shape or form. And I know, but I, I also know that sometimes you go to another parish that, you know, what I'm, I'm like I say, I feel very privileged in my parish and you go, what is this nightmare? You know? <laughs> so I do think the, like that I, I have really got an affection for the old right. And there was this whole, whole thing. I don't know if you heard about it, the reform of the reform. And that's one of the things that um, Cardinal Seurat is really sort of, so that, that, which was the idea that uh, young priests learning to say the old rite in Samoran Pontificum would pick up good habits and that would improve the way that they said the new rite. And I think that my experience talking to priests was that that was something that was going on. Um, and obviously now with um, Traditionis Custodes, the jailers of tradition, <laughs> um, Pope Francis seems to have uh, sadly brought a stop to that. I don't know that he can or whether, I don't think he can, because I think when they changed it in the 60s, there wasn't a movement like there is now. There, now there's a massive movement of people who are so in love with um, our, the treasure of our faith, you know, the mass of the saints and the martyrs that I don't think they can stop it. So that was one point. Go on. What are you, have you, have, I'd love to hear what you think I, about. Well, I, I don't want to be simplistic, but, but the way I've understood... Um, my relationship with the Latin Mass and with Novice Ordo is is essentially that it's it's the working out of the relationship with the Trinity, because the, the Trinity the Trinity seems to me to to offer a different dimensions of our aspects of our relationship with God, and so the Father is is always an Isaiah six high and lifted up and 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 utterly awesome, and like Isaiah we. We fall to our feet and says, "Woe is me! I am a man of unclean lips." And the Latin Mass is is a matter of trans, of utter transcendence and quite beautiful. And none of these are exclusively one person of the Trinity, but there's something most and wonderfully awesome and transcendent. But we we are, you know, we're we're incarnate creatures, and we need imminence too. We need Jesus to come along as our friend. And I I think the novice order is great. I need to take communion regularly. I'd be very disappointed to go back 50 years and be told I couldn't take the host as often as I might hope to. I think, as you, as you say, it's a great improvement and wonderful. And so we have imminence working. But I happen to be a charismatic. And well, just because, why would you not want more of the Holy Spirit? And so there's this movement of, 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 of God from out there alongside and then inside. And so one one of the reasons why one one can go for something even more intensely intimate than a novice auto is because you welcome the Holy Spirit to, to what to do whatever He wants. So we have these three dimensions of 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 love, of loving and being loved, and the fact that the liturgy embodies those and it, it is a good thing. Why would why would we want to be stuck only with transcendence or only with imminence or only with with charismatic ecstasy? I mean, we need we need all three, and I think. I think it's wonderful that, that, that I, I love the Catholic Church that above all in all the different denominations, it, it expresses the fullness of the Holy Trinity in a way that other denominations don't because they get stuck in one particular cultural mode of being. So, you know, I love what you say, Mark, about the fact that you want both the Latin Mass and the Novus Ordo and then the Holy Spirit throws in additionally. Mm. Mm. Well, I always think when you when you do the office online, um, 
I find that, that beautiful. You know, so, like, so what I'm saying is what we want is Jesus, isn't it? And yeah. if we're, yeah. the, the, what, what Jesus wants is our sincerity, is our hearts, not our lip service. And, yeah. and that's the most important thing. And that's what we need to focus on is, you know, that um, if the, the liturgy provides us with a, a doorway into that transcendent reality, uh, but an ultimate imminence in surely in the blessed sacrament. So we've got both of those elements coming together in the mass. And I just think it's, well, as the, as the further I get, the older I get, the more I just love it. And, you know, just want to be at mass all, all the time if I could. So the other point that I, I wanted to make was, um, and, you know, Peter Krasniewski is someone that I've had the pleasure of meeting on numerous occasions and is an absolute gentleman and a scholar and um, in the same mould, you know, I'd say I love um, everything he has to say. I think he's absolutely brilliant. But uh, I think there's a lot of talk of throwing out Vatican II, you know, like, and Peter would be one of those people I think who would be extremely harsh. And as we were saying on the podcast, that is... I shouldn't say extremely harsh, but he would be harsh about the damage wrought by Vatican II. And I think one of the key points, and Professor Stephen Bullivan makes this brilliantly in his book, Mass Exodus, mm. is that it was, um, you know, so that basically, um, I don't want to build up a straw man here, but the way that I've heard the argument is that um, basically it was that, that everything, that all the problems we're facing are a result of Vatican II. And we talked about that, didn't we? We talked about, the way that um, there were ambiguities in the documents and the church did try its best to work those out in post-conciliar documents. Um, but I think to say that everything was, that without Vatican II, you know, um, Cardinal, um, Archbishop Vigano has, has recently done a polemic where he's sort of been saying, let's get rid of Vatican II, we need to just draw a line through it. And I think that we should fight throughout the year. Ooh, <laughs> But I think we, we saw um, a decline throughout the practice of religion post World War II. And I think that, you know, if that was the case, if it was Vatican II, then you wouldn't be able to see parallels in, you know, Anglicanism or Orthodoxy, or and those parallels do exist. So I just felt I didn't really make that that case, you know, in the podcast that um, I think that you have to look at the evidence, you have to follow the evidence and say that that, you know, that all right, there are there may be elements in Vatican II that contributed to that decline, mm. um, especially the, I think, some of the things with uh, the priesthood and religious life. But I, I don't think you can say it's it's all to blame, basically. No, you, it's about correlation and causality. Correlation, all these things are happening, but there's no necessarily causal nexus. And I think one of the things one would have to say is that it's it's the it's a profoundly anti-Christian spirit that emerged after the Second World War and expressed itself in so many ways, uh, both in terms of intellectual nihilism and sexual abandonment and the breaking down of families and abortion. There's a whole series of cultural and spiritual um, destructive toxic forces that quite by themselves adequately explain where the church has got to. As it happened, it began to moderate some of its own practices, but they're not causally responsible for it, although they may not put up as much a defense as they as we would have had otherwise. It's a much more complex relationship than that. I'm sure you're right, we shouldn't attack Vatican II for things it's not responsible for. Exactly, and I, I think that, if, you know, it was an attempt to come to grips with some of those uh, the challenges that the, that were being thrown up by society, I and I, if I'm honest, I don't think it did a good enough job. You know, like it really needed, um, you know, to isolate exactly what the problems were. And of course, it's much easier to do that with hindsight, isn't it? We, you know, we can look back and make those judgments. I think at the time. So my theory really is that what we should do is we should say, right, that's Vatican II. That is something that happened in the sixties and you know, read our faith in the history of the magisterium and, and tradition, what's been handed on to us and that it's consistent with everything that's gone before. Put Vatican II aside, stop trying to say it's all or or it's mm -hmm. nothing, you know, try to stop. it seems like people either see everything through the lens of Vatican II or nothing, you know, they either want it one way or the other and just say, you know, because there's loads of councils that uh, were of their time and spoke to things that were going on at that particular time and that we don't quote and bring up all the time now. So, you know, we just need to crack on 
with because things have changed, haven't they? Loads of things have changed. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, well, I would recommend to to go to the podcast, Merely Catholic podcast, where Gavin and Mark discuss this in in detail, and it's well worth listening to. I think you really give a great explanation of Vatican II, uh, how it's understood now, what we call the spirit of Vatican II, but really beautifully because, as you say, we 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 don't reject, actually the documents. The first thing is just read the documents because the documents are, are brilliant. Um, and I think it's impossible to have a view on it either way if you don't actually just see what see what's come out of Vatican II. But a brilliant discussion by both of you. Um, so please go and listen. And I think that's it, because we're coming up. That's it. <laughs> brilliant, Job okay. Done. Well, you've heard it here that we, we have all three of us this week uh, written something at the Catholic Herald. So if you haven't uh, had a chance to go and subscribe, do, do, subscribe do, to the Catholic actually, Herald. Yes. <laughs> I mean, do it's really brilliant. I think it's a brilliant. It has some great outputs and fantastic writers, um, and uh, really well worth diving into. So that let me let me be let me be apocalyptic for the moment and say, if you don't subscribe to the Catholic Herald, you will allow the tablet to speak for the Church in England and Wales, and that would that would whilst the tablet has some virtues. That's not a desirable outcome. Hey, um, that's it. That's it for uh, 10. We're on 10 already. So it's goodbye from me, Catherine Bennett. It's goodbye from me, Mark. <laughs> Where did that come from? Where is that? Honest, isn't it? Goodbye from him. Goodbye from me. You're going into what your channel hits. It's Ronnie Barker. Is it the Ronnie or <laughs> Morecambe and Wise? It's, I mean, who knows? Who knows? A, a, a dreadful, a dreadful it. cross to. to, to anyway, <laughs> we won't go there. And um, and God bless you from Gavin Ashenden. <laughs>